day on CityCast DC, Washington is on the cusp of a new stadium debate. The commanders, now under new ownership, want out of Landover, and the mayor wants to bring them back to the old RFK Stadium site. But it is not a slam dunk. Even if you ignore the question of who pays for it, plenty of people don't think a football stadium is the best use for one of the city's few open parcels of land. The Washington Post's Sam Fortier is here to explain who's who. Today is Thursday, July 20th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Hey, Sam, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. So, James Comer, member of Congress, has introduced legislation that would maybe possibly give the old RFK site back to the commanders. What's in this legislation? Why is it happening now? Yeah, so basically, we don't know the exact specifics uh, of this legislation, but it is legislation that would be, as we understand it, a lease modification and extension to give control of RFK back to the city. Right now, it's owned by the Department of Interior, managed by the National Park Service. And so that's sort of not allowed them to do much development. There's a couple soccer fields over there, but mostly it's just the rusty bucket RFK Stadium that uh, DC once knew and loved pretty well. So um, why now? Obviously the city has tried over and over again to get the site back. And they've been unsuccessful for a bunch of reasons. Last year, they tried policy riders on larger pieces of legislation. Miro Bowser has been a a strong champion for the commanders to return to that site. So obviously, I think you're seeing the mayor circumvent Eleanor Holmes Norton, the representative, and go to the Hill and say, House Republicans, will you work with me? And James Comer has raised his hand and said, yes, I will help you. So in theory, though, this bill just transfers control to the city. It doesn't say anything about whether the city should put a stadium there or housing or a shopping mall or, or whatever else you could do. Yeah. And, and I want to be very clear that there are two avenues for, for D.C. to, you know, quote unquote, gain more control. And this is not a land transfer, a land transfer, which would give D.C. ownership of the site was going to be a much bigger ask. So right now you're seeing a lease modification and extension. And that's important because right now the federal government is leasing uh, the land to D.C. And, and the lease right now only runs through 2038. And the land usage is restricted to sports, entertainment, and recreation. And so theoretically, like you could build an NFL stadium on it right now, but no NFL owner would do it when the term is is only until 2038. You need a a much longer runway for that. So basically what this legislation will do, and one person told me that that the thing that's being entertained right now is they're going to do a 99-year extension and that they're going to take away all the restrictions. So in the NFL, it's, it's very important to NFL owners that their new stadiums are no longer the anchor of a sea of parking lot, right? So instead, what you're hoping to see is it as an anchor of a mixed use development. So even though DC won't own the land, they'll probably try to do rental housing. They'll probably try to do retail, hotels. I think that their ideal would be to do for the RFK site what Nats Park did for the Capitol Riverfront and sort of, you know, energize that area economically. So what you're saying, though, is that the the legislation would likely change the rules so that the city wouldn't have to put a stadium at all or wouldn't have to have sports uses at all, whatever it wanted with the space. Exactly. They could do only housing. They could do a bunch of different things. But given the way that this has transpired, Muriel Bowser going to James Comer, I think that there is a pretty good understanding that this is ultimately for the Washington commanders. Right. No, we know what Bowser wants. And I have a feeling what members of Congress who get involved in things like this want is the thing that the larger businesses prefer. But there's kind of two issues here. One is, uh, should this football team get a new stadium? Should it move out of Landover? Should it move to Washington or some other place? And then the second issue, the kind of local politics issue is, is putting a football stadium on that site the best thing for D.C.? Let's talk about the team first. Why do they want out of Landover? The stadium sucks. To be very blunt, it was. Oh, built- it's only been like it's only been like twenty five years or thirty <laughs> years or something. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's pretty remarkable because 
basically when Jack Ken Cook, the former owner, when he and the DC Council ultimately disagreed and he decided to move out to Landover, he he wanted to build it. He was going through some health complications. He ended up dying. And so he wanted this stadium to be done quickly. And he wanted it to be massive because, you know, in the year 2000, you know, this team was, according to Forbes, the most viable sports franchise in the world. Obviously, everyone in the, in the region knows how massive it was. And so he was concentrated on, on putting up something cheaply, quickly, massive. And so I think a, a really good contrast for this is the Baltimore Ravens, their stadium, M&T Stadium, is pretty much the same age and it's held up much better. FedEx Field has had an array of complications. You know, the first year that I was covering the team, there was some liquid that leaked on fans. Fans say it was sewage. The team says it was a water main. You know, a couple of years ago, some fans were going down to celebrate the Eagles win in Washington, which there's been a lot of problems with, you know, opposing crowds as the team has disintegrated. But the railing of the stadium fell and it almost fell on the quarterback of the Eagles. So there's just been a lot of embarrassing moments. Some people inside the team even refer to the stadium as like Mm -hmm. an old used car that you have to fix up. So they're desperate to get out of Landover for sure. Right. When, when Jack and Cook uh, built that stadium, they treated him like a hero because he paid for it himself. But I guess what you, you get what you pay for. <laughs> so they want out of this stadium or they want to not be driving around in a used car. Can they fix it or could they do what they want to do by staying in Landover? I think it's possible. I, I don't think that you could take the current structure of FedEx Field and make it do what you want. I think that the upgrades are, are, are too steep. The infrastructure is too poor. Right now, I would say that FedEx is, is definitely a bottom three, probably maybe the worst stadium in the NFL. And so I think that they're looking for a, a clean start. One option is basically to go across the parking lot because the new owner is going to own roughly 200 acres at that FedEx site basically in Maryland. And so he could go and say, hey, I'm going to do FedEx 2.0 across the parking lot. But I think that just in terms of a location, um, in terms of separating themselves from the Ravens, I think that there would be a desire to move to either Virginia or DC. Hey DC, Bridget Todd here. On this podcast, we work hard to bring you the most important and entertaining conversations happening around our city. But that's not all we do. We also have a daily newsletter that brings you so much more. Our free daily newsletter, Hey DC, is written and curated by Kayla Cote Stimmerman. You may have heard her behind the mic a couple of times. The Hey DC newsletter is your daily toolkit for being a more informed and engaged citizen of DC. It's packed with recommendations, tips, and secrets for seizing everything that DC has to offer. You can subscribe to Hey DC by texting DC to 66866. That's 66866. So putting on your your NFL reporter hat, what's the broader trend here? Like we know that in in baseball with 81 home games a year and the basketball hockey arenas, the the trend had been to move into the center of city to vibrant neighborhoods. Football is a different culture. People drive in, they they like to tailgate, they like to do all that stuff. Are teams wanting to be in central cities? Do we have a sense that they would, just because Bowser wants them in RFK, that they would want to be in an urban neighborhood? So... It, it is tough to, to tell what the new ownership group wants because obviously they the sale has not been ratified yet. And I think that it's important to remember whether it's in an urban area or a suburban area, really what they want is money and they want the most attractive mm-hmm. economic opportunity. And I think that that takes a lot of different forms, but mostly the trends I think that you're seeing is that they want the football stadium, because it's not going to be full 81 games a year like a baseball stadium, at the anchor of an economic mixed-use development. And the examples that stick out to me, I think probably the first one um, was in Foxborough, Massachusetts, where the New England Patriots play. How far is that from Boston? Uh, I want to say it's about 30 miles, which is definitely one of the, the larger distances between like a city center and an NFL stadium. Inglewood, the, the Rams, uh, you know, they're 10 to 15 miles outside of LA, but but in each case, you're seeing them build a lot of, if not team controlled, there's definitely just economic opportunity there. And so I imagine that that would be key, not just for 
the new owner coming in to make money. But every time you build a new stadium, every time you do something like that, you boost uh, the valuation of the other NFL teams just by, by being in an economically advantageous situation, buying up real estate like that. So I think that the new owners would probably like to be at RFK. And I don't even know if that's purely economic because I do think the fan base of this team has degraded so far in the last 24 years under the ownership of Dan Snyder that being at RFK, which people around the team call the spiritual home of this franchise, I think that would do immeasurable good and it would really be a fig leaf to the fan base that has suffered through so much for so long. So, all right, so we know what the the team wants. And and as you say, money is a big deal. These, this ownership team has just paid $6 billion, with a B, dollars, and they're going to want to make some of that back as quickly as they can. The question of what's good for D.C., there was an op-ed from Kenyon McDuffie, who had been previously a skeptic, saying he wants the commanders to return to D.C. What's the argument for why we should want this team within the District of Columbia? <laughs> The argument for why you would want them, I think, is is twofold. One is sort of a, a baseline civic pride. Hey, this is our team. They used to play here. They should be in our city because you have such a, a wide region here in, in, you know, in terms of D.C., Maryland and Virginia. This is the central location. It makes the most sense. And like now that we have a new owner, hopefully putting them in our in our city center would coincide with a return to glory you know those 80s and 90s super bowl years like that's possible and we should have them you know in a central location and and we should be proud to have them here the other argument which i think is much more tenuous is this is a good economic driver for our city and i think the mayor in particular she's talked before about hey What we did on the Capitol Riverfront, Navy Yard, you know, the wharf in terms of having Nats Park down there, that was a huge success. And we should do that for Hill East. And RFK would be a big part of that. I think that there is obviously some contention there um, on, on both points. Charles Allen, you know, the council member and others and Phil Mendelson have said, hey, we need to use this 190 acre site for housing, for other means There's a lot of sports economists out there who would say the economic argument is tenuous because when a team pays for a study to say, here's how much economic value we're adding to a region, you have to question the conclusions of that. And if a baseball stadium brings in people 81 times a year, a football stadium is only going to have eight or 10 if they make the playoffs, maybe a Taylor Swift concert every now and then. That's, That's a much, much smaller benefit. And football fans don't tend to like hit the restaurants after a game they, because they've been tailgating. Absolutely. I think that that's, it's a totally different culture. And I would say that Nats Park, which is on track to pay off its bonds by 2028, according to the city CFO, that is a, a major outlier, not just in sports stadiums, but also specifically baseball stadiums, which do have the increased traffic, which you mentioned. So using that as a model, I think it is questionable, but Again, I think that you have the civic pride as well. And I think that, you know, in the same way that D.C. Mayor Tony Williams was the guy who brought baseball back to D.C., I think Mayor Bowser, as a legacy component, I think it was it'd be attractive to her to be the mayor who brought football back into the city. So for a long time, because Dan Snyder had such a toxic reputation, the move for elected officials was like, hell no, so long as he's there and so long as their name is, is a racist name, we don't want them here. Those two things are gone. So now we are in a sort of clean slate. What is your sense of the council and the sort of city political opinion about whether in the abstract they want to use that site for a stadium, whether they want the team back? We know what Bowser wants, but as you've said, there's a sort of an opportunity cost argument. This is a huge site. The city is short on housing. We could do something else with it, too. What the council thinks is is a major question, and I think one we won't know until push comes to shove, until it's time to really vote. The last major data point that we have is last July in 2022, Charles Allen led a seven-member majority of the 13-member council in terms of sending a letter, I believe, to Eleanor Holmes Norton and saying, we do not want the stadium here. We, we, we want to use it for other purposes. And, and the dynamics of the council have changed. Two of those members are no longer on the council after elections last fall. And so uh, I think it's much more of an open question. And as you noted, Kenyon McDuffie has come out and sort of become a public champion of the commanders returning to RFK, which is, I think, very notable because he is 
the only one, I think, along with Mayor Bowser, who is at least vocally, regularly saying this should happen. And so it's tough, right? Because baseball passed on a seven to six vote in which three of those seven yeses were lame ducks. And so I think that like, if, if you went up to all 13 council members right now and you said, where do you stand? I, I just don't think that that would be a good barometer of what actually could happen push come to shove. Based on trends and your reporting, what would an RFK site with a football stadium look like? Basically, what I have to go on here is proposals that have been made in the past. And I think that in an ideal world, you, you would build the stadium, you would build some level of parking, you have Metro, they would really want it to look like Navy Yard in terms of the football stadium is the anchor, you'd be surrounded by retail and restaurants and apartments. I think affordable apartments particularly would be critical to that proposal. But I do think, you know, going back to this not being a land transfer is a weakness because if you had a land transfer, at least in terms of the city pitching, hey, this is affordable housing, because if you don't own the land, you cannot sell those properties. So it's going to be rental units at this point. I think the only other thing that we know is that I believe it was the 2022 fiscal budget. They passed a a sort of indoor sports complex for $60 million, which uh, I believe would have, you know, a pool and like a track and field athletic facility. Mm -hmm. Sam Fortier, thank you so much for being here. Oh, of course. Thank you for having me. Before you go, here is some quick news. Construction has finally begun on the infamous Dave Thomas Circle. The project will reconfigure the traffic pattern, add green space, and build protected bike lanes. The construction should finish by next December. You can vote on the intersection's new name among five options. You ready? Douglas Crossing, Three Stars Plaza, Mamie Peanut Johnson Plaza, Tiber Gateway, and Peoples Plaza. I am partial to Mamie Peanut Johnson, for the record. Also, Virginia changed its policies on the treatment of transgender students in schools. The policies emphasize the role of parents, requiring schools to defer to a student's guardian on decisions regarding names and pronouns. Also, bathrooms and sex-separated school activities will be determined by the sex assigned at birth rather than gender identity. Those in opposition say those policies create hostile and dangerous learning environments. And finally, Prince George's County passed a Healthy Restaurant Act that will offer grants and zero interest rates loans to incentivize eateries to offer healthier items. To qualify, restaurants must have 40% of their meals be considered quote-unquote healthy and have at least one plant-based option. The long-term goal is to prevent illnesses like heart disease and diabetes among county residents. The program kicks off in September. And that's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoy the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye.